So we're, we're now going to move on to James. Uh, James Bolsworth, uh, CRM Agri. And um, James, uh, uh, obviously giving you a challenge as well. <laughs> yeah. Which you uh, raised too. Um, uh, is there any point in marketing your grain in a volatile market? Okay, so uh, perhaps you're going to explain that, explain that perhaps uh, there is, I don't know. So I'm going to hand over to, to James. A couple of minutes on your bio, James, and as, as where you've come from, uh, where you studied originally. Absolutely, yeah. So get Gary calls it a, a challenge. I'd probably say been chucked under the bus slightly, but uh, we'll figure it out. It was, a, it was a bit of a journey, actually, putting this talk together because it's made me question my career choice quite a bit as we went. But uh, as an independent grain marketing advisor, um, it's essentially what we do. So I, I'm, I'm speaking from a slightly conflicted point of bias um, uh, when answering this, but it, it was a very interesting topic. Um, uh, so yeah, is there any point marketing your grain uh, I I due to the volatility? Uh, and I was actually speaking to a, a client on the way on the way up here, and he was like, "Where are you off to?" As I explained, I was coming to coming to talk here, and 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 told him what the topic was, and he goes, um, "Well, yeah, surely in a volatile market, it's the only time in which there's point in marketing your grain." Because he said, "If if if uh, if it wasn't volatile, then I wouldn't have a need for your services." And I thought that was quite an interesting perspective, and. Uh, would have saved me a lot of time if I'd spoken to him a week ago, but <laughs> we'll work our way through the slide deck anyway. And uh, I think probably you know, a good place to start, um, just to sort of, from a different perspective, well, I'll introduce myself first. James Bolsworth, Managing Director of CRM Agri Commodities. Um, I've been advising farmers, agribusiness, food companies on, on markets and marketing uh, uh, for 13 years, uh, set up CRM Agri in, in 2014. Um, and yeah, we work with farmers and uh, other businesses uh, right across Europe um, uh, in, in many different sectors, but predominantly here in the UK, it is uh, advising farmers and growers on marketing strategies and, and markets and what's going on. But uh, yeah, just to sort of think about whether there's point in marketing your crop, um, uh, I suppose imagine, imagine, humor me for a second and imagine you're a, you're a startup business um, uh, and you're going on Dragon's Den, you've got a great idea, you know, you say, I, I want to produce food. Uh, I need to raise millions to buy machines and warehouses and drones and hundreds of thousands in, in you know, variable costs uh, uh, you know, for, for, for your people, your drivers, your, your chemicals, your, your gamekeeper, your accountants. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Peter Jones would be interested. He goes, you know, so what's your, what's your marketing strategy? How are you going to sell this, um, this product? And um, uh, you, know, you say, well, I'm just sort of going to wing it and see what happens. And uh, you know, ima imagine, imagine the reaction. I know f for, most, for most farmers, it's, uh, it's not a scenario you'd ever find yourselves in. But I think it's an interesting perspective, um, particularly when you consider it from another business's point of view, because uh, you know, an airline will, in most cases, hedge their, their fuel requirements. Um, a fertilizer manufacturer would hedge their, their gas and, and indeed their output fertilizer as well in, in, in a lot of cases. Because they're in the game of, of margin preservation or, or maximization, they're in the game of risk management, as well as producing products and providing services. Um, and I think you know, that's an interesting way to sort of enter uh, this query and, and conundrum as, as we move forward. Um, I won't delve too much into, into what we do because I've sort of broadly explained it, but yeah, as a business, we work with uh, research providers and independent firms all around the world in major producing and exporting regions. We collect a lot of data. Um, uh, we collect data from many different countries and in different languages in some cases, uh, and we'll share information with these people. They're all independent intelligence partners, we call them, uh, with the job of ultimately providing uh, that data and research in the form of insights to our clients so they understand what's going on and can make better decisions. Um, I won't go through all of these, but you know, commodities, we're looking at anything from wheat and corn and, and barley and rapeseed produced here in the UK to palm and sunflower, um, which uh, particularly palm, I haven't found anybody growing palm here in the UK yet, but uh, um, may maybe over time. Uh, uh, we cover all the major producing and exporting regions as well. Uh, so um, you, know, you name it from the Black Sea to South America to China. Um, supply, demand, uh, we do price forecasting, weather, freight. Uh, we look at politics, obviously, and the macroeconomic impacts of, of what's going on on markets uh, to condense us into the services which we, we provide um, to our clients. So I suppose, what is, what is grain marketing? And uh, to begin with, I, I think, you know, I, I just proclaim that I'm, 
I, I'm not a prophet, you know, none of us are, none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, particularly in a market so heavily driven by, by uh, politics, geopolitics at the moment, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, uh, none of us know what is going to happen next. None of us know what the weather will be like this spring in, in the US uh, or the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but what we do understand um, is you know, our businesses and the risks which they're exposed to. And uh, as a business, and you know, all businesses have access to a large amount of data and information uh, which allows you to quantify that risk and make decisions based upon it. And, and that's the game which we're in as a business. It's not to tell you what Putin is going to do next, clearly an impossible task, um, which maybe he doesn't even know, but um, it's to understand the risks which are facing the markets. And hopefully I can um, uh, allude to some of those as we move forward and, uh, and you'll get a better picture of, of, of uh, our view of marketing, how to manage risk, but also some of the key drivers now and, and what we see impacting markets going forward. Um, so I actually, like um, any true millennial, uh, put uh, the question of what is grain marketing into, into a, an artificial intelligence bot chat GPD to ask it the question, uh, just as a bit of an experiment, and it came out with a, a remarkable uh, well, remarkably true answer, actually. So it's effective grain marketing refers to the process of selling grain in a strategic and profitable manner whilst managing risk. It didn't actually say that. I added that. Um, it involves analysing market conditions, determining the most appropriate time to sell and identifying the most profitable pricing and delivery opportunities. I thought that was a, a fairly sort of conclusive summary of what grain marketing is. It's not you going out there and putting adverts on Twitter saying you've got you know, grain to sell um, uh, or, or, or billboards at the end of the farm drive. Um, marketing in the context of, of, of grain and, and producing is, is, is essentially what it says here. Um, you decide you know, when to sell your crop or when not to sell your crop um, uh, and you decide who to sell to. Um, uh, and then ultimately you choose uh, how to manage, um, manage the price risk. So that is you know, really what's meant by the term grain marketing uh, with an emphasis on, on price risk. Um, and I think, what is that risk? Well, the risk here, you know, we're looking at the UK feed wheat. Uh, we're looking at it going back now to 2000, so you know, nearly 13 years of, of data. And uh, it's pretty clear what, what, what the risk is, um, I think. You know, it's always worth you looking at the other risks on a, on a farming business and uh, you know, obviously we have yield. Yield is a primary risk. You need to have a crop in order to sell a crop and, uh, and it is probably the main risk which most growers will focus most of their time, uh, their capital, their energy into managing and, and rightly slow. so and you know, on average in the UK we're now we're pretty good at it. Um, you know, the, the year to year variation in yield of wheat, uh, if we go back 10 years, is around 7%. Um, uh, and you know, that, that, I think, is down to advances in technology and skills and, and the investment which has been made over, over a long period of time. But if we compare that to the yields within uh, the grain markets, we're now looking at, over the same period, around 50% variation year to year. Um, and I, I think, yeah, it's an interesting point to make when considering that how and whether it's worth managing risk, because it is clearly a major risk. You know, when you look at price volatility, which is faced uh, by a business, um, by a farming business, I suppose the question is, is, is enough time spent on trying to manage that risk? Uh, not saying that you should do nothing about yield, but saying, is it a fair balance based on the risks which are being faced? Um, is enough time being spent focusing on the markets and the marketing? Uh, because I'm sure Gary will tell us it's, it has a big impact on, on the bottom line um, at the end of the day, as we've seen this year in particular. Yeah. So there's different types of marketing. Um, uh, yeah, we've, we've got harvest sellers. Uh, you might have a, a long holder, uh, someone selling for cash flow, um, impulse or gut feel marketing. Um, I'm sure everybody's been there. Uh, contracts, um, so selling a crop on produced on contract, contract price maybe, contract volume, contract quality. Uh, the hedging uh, strategy, uh, and then you may have a combination of them all, or you know, what we focus on is risk management. So, uh, and to define that, it's taking an analytical approach to marketing, um, uh, understanding seasonality, uh, realizing that it's a long game, you're not in it to sort of um, blow the doors off on day one and then, and then re retire young. You might be, but, uh, but uh, most people have realistic expectations, realizing that the top of the market is fairly unachievable. 
but the bottom is not where you want to be. And it's a case of how do you manage uh, that and balance that in order to achieve something which is sensible and, and you know, can continue to, to sustain long-term growth if that's what you're looking to do within a business. Um, spreading the risk, using all the tools, and uh, you know, setting targets. Um, but the most important thing is, is having a strategy. And I think that's what risk management is really about, uh, understanding what risks the business is exposed to when it comes to markets, and then what you can do in order to manage those risks. So I'll start off uh, just by like, sort of working through some of those, some of those uh, factors. And, uh, and I think you know, from a strategy point of view, this is just a snapshot. This is the sort of thing um, which we send out every week, twice a week actually, to, to our clients so they can see you know, where uh, we would advise them being and have a sort of more holistic approach to the marketing strategy, not just looking at what's in the ground or what's in the shed, but also focusing on the next year and the year after and uh, starting to look at you know, some of those long-term drivers and, and uh, not necessarily basing it purely on whether you're bullish and bearish, but also considering um, uh, you know, what it means for the business, whether there's margin there. Um, for example, uh, last summer, uh, we didn't advise to sell 20% of, of the new crop, uh, which is about to be harvested, because we were bullish or bearish on price. We did it because most clients were fer purchasing fertilizer and there was a margin there which could be secured. And uh, you know, that's always the way in our opinion, you start a strategy. You start off by protecting downside, and then you can build on that as, uh, as you go forward throughout the season. There's always ways to, to build a strategy as you move forward. Um, and that strategy is ultimately dictated by cash flow, um, uh, a budget, uh, the volume you've got to sell, having rules and targets, uh, access to storage or not, and risk appetite. And, uh, and of course, you know, the tools which you've uh, got access to as a business in order to manage that risk and market the crop. So to put all, some of that into data, and uh, I realize that none of you will be able to see anything which is on this slide, particularly in this left-hand chart, but essentially uh, to break it down, what we've done here is, uh, and you know, we like a bit of data, and what we've done is we've taken that data, we've taken an average price going back 23 years, so every month average price for UK wheat, and uh, in short, Dark red is the lowest average of a year, a calendar year, not a season. And the dark green is the highest price. And so this, this should form part of a strategy in our view is understanding that seasonality as I've, I've alluded to and uh, maybe busting some of the myths. You know, for example, some may not want to sell anything and they have to sell it all at harvest in our view. And the data would suggest that's a, that's a pretty bad can, idea. Can you see the, the, the top start with months on the top? Yeah, so months on the top and then years down here. Yeah, so, so can you read out the months on the top? Yeah, so, the so the you've got August, September, October. And what this highlights basically is that August, September, October, historically speaking, is not a very good time to be selling grain. So if you need to sell grain in August, September, October, and that's part of that strategy and that cash flow, you're better off doing it if there's opportunities pre-harvest than waiting and then selling it because you've suddenly realized you've got too much to store or need the cash or whatever it is. So that's sort of the point. And just if you, you know, for, the, for the statistical aficionados, yeah, if you sell in July and August, there's a 72% chance you will be selling in the lowest two months. Going back from a probab probability basis, going back over the past 23 years, 72% chance you're selling in the lowest two months. There's a 9% chance you're gonna hit the top of the market so as I said, yeah, forward sales, often the best policy and something to consider if you have to sell at harvest. Equally though, you, you often come across uh, people who always store until, until the end of the season. Never sell anything before that, that's the policy that's always worked. But if you look at the numbers, you're better off doing that than selling at harvest, absolutely. But there's a 60% chance if you sell in May or June that you're gonna hit the highest average month um, or one of those highest average months but then there's still a 33% chance you're gonna hit the lowest average months. So whether or not it's worth the risk is up to you and, and something you, know, <laughs> you need to consider, but that's the data, that's what we've got access to, and that ultimately can help make those future decisions and something we definitely consider within the strategies when we're putting them together and, and advising on them. Another factor, um, Everybody always wants to beat the average. You know, we hear it, I just want to be better than average, I want to beat the average by X pounds a ton. We would always say in order, in order to beat the average, you need to know where the average is. So every day, every week, 
we're tracking the average. We're tracking 50 day moving averages. So here, this black line over the wheat market here is basically looking at the 50 day moving average. We also look at 100 day, 200 day moving averages. And it, it doesn't necessarily tell us where the market's going. It tells us whether or not this is an opportunity relative to historical pricing. So if, you, if you're wanting to beat the average and suddenly the market is trading 10, 15, 20 pounds a ton above the 200 day moving average or 100 day moving average, it's probably a good idea to start looking at letting some go and, and selling into the market. Um, uh, and it's just another guide, another element of building a strategy. There's lots of blocks which, which come together. Also, we can look at momentum indicators. You know, is the market looking overbought or oversold? And here, you know, this is one of the indicators which we'll use at the bottom to give me its buy or sell signals. Um, again, it's not the be all and end all, but it's another indicator which helps in getting that timing right and making those decisions. Another factor, and again, all this data um, is, is, is accessible if, if you go looking for it. Um, uh, we look at investor sentiment. So at the moment, we all know that interest rates are rising. Uh, good news for some, not so good for others. Uh, but when it comes down to markets, it's clearly not good news. And, and that is because commodity markets, here you've got the UK wheat price. The UK wheat price is in blue. And in yellow, you've got the Chicago wheat price. And we've basically converted those into pounds a tonne. And you can see that, yeah, obviously, we're, we're part of this global market. We track, we track that um, pretty consistently. What we've seen is obviously higher Federal Reserve US interest rates month after month. It looks to continue going higher. They've just produced some more poor economic results than anybody was expecting. So we're likely to see this trend continue. And of course, the UK, Europe, uh, everybody else is following suit. Um, what that means is for commodities, you have a lot of investors, a lot of speculators who hold commodities, who hold wheat, and they are not as motivated to hold wheat when the return is going to be less because commodities are non-interest rate, interest-bearing assets. So if they can go and put it into debt or uh, stock markets or whatever it might be where there's going to be a return on that investment, they're likely to do so, and that's exactly what we've seen. So as this market has fallen quite dramatically since the last year, it's no surprise that, and on the right, we're looking at fund positions, so hedge funds, speculative funds, they have been selling. And they've accrued one of the shortest positions, the most bearish positions in markets, which uh, almost going back for about eight to 10 years. And uh, that puts a lot of pressure on prices. And it's again, another factor. If you know that interest rates are gonna rise, which most people had that inclination, and, uh, and it's pretty well voiced, uh, and you know the, the, the position which a, a fund might take as a result of that, then it's another tool and another bit of intelligence which we can use to help build a strategy and make those decisions. And it, it, it's sort of an elastic band which has been stretched when these funds have been selling and selling and selling for so long. So that's another element of it. Um, farm economics as well. There's some other, you know, without having to speculate on whether uh, Putin is going to escalate the war, we can look at some pretty simple things to help us understand what supply and demand by, might be next year. And on the left, we're essentially looking at the US, in the, in the US, the price of corn relative to the price of soybeans. And farmers in the US will generally plant one or, or more of one or less of one, depending on that price difference. It's a price ratio, and we can see here that price ratio is now historically very low. For this time of year, when farmers are now making their decisions, purchasing their seed for spring plantings, they're not encouraged to plant as much uh, uh, as, as many soybeans because the price of soybeans is low relative to that historical price. And what we've done is we put that on a chart on the right here. You can see basically when that ratio is low like it is now, the area of soybeans falls to the detriment of corn. So again, it's another indicator which we can start to use to assume what's the global <laughs> supply of corn and, and grains more broadly going to be next year and, uh, and, and going forward. There's also climatic patterns. Um, and again, you know, we all know how uh, impactful the weather is on yields. Uh, we can get a fairly good idea um, when we look on a global scale as to these trends. So here on the left, we're looking at the ENSO probability. So are we going to be in a La Nina or an El Nino? We can see now, by the time we get to July, August, September, uh, the summer, we're looking at a 60% probability 
that 50% probability that we're going to be in uh, an El, Ni El Nino year. And again, we can look at El Nino relative to major yields of exporters and producers around the world. And there's a pretty good relationship between El Nino and when it's strong, Australia produce less wheat. You know, that's, that's a historical pattern which we see. And again, it's just getting those guides and those triggers in order to help base our assumptions for next year on something rather than just hope for the best and, and see what happens. And then, of course, we've got some of the more simple things in the USDA report, looking at global stocks, looking at uh, current crop conditions, monitoring those on a regular basis. I think as well, you know, topical at the moment is Ukraine. You know, we know, obviously, they are a major producer and a major exporter. We've seen that, um, and we've seen how uh, uh, reliant the world is on Ukraine and, indeed, Russian supplies of wheat and corn and barley and rapeseed and sunflower. Uh, here, the point to make is that farmers have now had time to uh, make decisions based upon the fact that there is a, a war going on in their country. And we've seen the area which they have planted fall, therefore the likelihood will be a fall in planted area. And therefore we can make assumptions based on slightly below average yields that we're going to see again another lower crop coming out of Ukraine. 15.6 million tonnes, half what it was back there. So that leads us to believe that even if we do suddenly start to see some sort of peace agreement or the flow of grain uh, goes back to normal, you've still got a lag there before one of the major producers and exporters of corn in the world um, and wheat starts to produce at, this, at a similar level to where they were before. Uh, seasonality, of course, you know, tracking these exports. One point to note is that the flow of grain through this grain corridor has been better than anybody had ever expected. Uh, and uh, that has been one of the big reasons prices have come under pressure so much since last summer. Uh, but I think the point is, at the moment, there is... It could go either way. So if this, if this uh, uh, grain corridor is not renegotiated in five weeks now, then you can start to see the potential for prices to rise. But also, at this point, the issue isn't necessarily the exports. The exports are working very well. The issue is around Turkey, and you've got about 120 ships now queued up because of this policy Russia have got where were they, in order to negotiate this, this corridor where they want to check every ship and make sure um, uh, and at the moment they're only able to check, they're only checking around four and a half uh, ships a day they have the capacity to do about 45, so they're running about 10% uh, and if you start to see them getting their act together and allowing more ships through then obviously that could add further pressure to markets, so um, there's two sides but one thing at the moment is you can see here the black line is Ukrainian milling wheat and it's the cheapest in the world. And as long as it's able to flow freely, it's going to keep prices under pressure um, going forwards. So what's the best strategy? Is there a point in having a marketing strategy? There isn't a silver bullet. Um, hopefully, you've seen some of the indicators we look at, some of the tools which we'll use um, and you know, farmers have access to. Uh, as I said, it's about protecting downside. I make this sort of analogy to fungicide because you don't necessarily apply fungicide hoping you're going to have a wet spring and it's going to do its job, you apply it just in case. It's an insurance policy. The same goes for markets and marketing in, in our view. Um, uh, having a strategy, have a set of predefined rules and then justify the decisions you, you, you make with clear analysis and you know, always take notes of why you sold on, on any given day. It's very good to, to, to go back to and, and you know, at least you know why you did it. Um, uh, so key areas to watch now going forwards Global economic health, I've mentioned, but inflation, interest rates, investment, global productivity, all these factors will have a bearing on commodity values going forward. The Ukraine war, obviously, global uh, and domestic supply and demand, whether uh, this transition from La Nino to El Nino, La Nina to El Nino is going to have a significant impact on production um, uh, over the next 12 to 18 months. And then, of course, trade and energy, and, uh, and yeah, much of those factors are always within these markets. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really enough. I mean, I, I won't go on too much about what we do. We've got a, a stand at the back, and, uh, and Mike and myself are here. So if you want to catch up and, and chat about that, then we can. But, you know, we, we do many types of research and strategic advice, uh, price forecasting as well, and um, providing growers uh, with uh, uh, strategies and regional groups. Um, so if, uh, yeah, if you want to chat about it afterwards, then 
please feel free, but I think I've probably gone over my time anyway. So. Fine, yeah. thank, thank you very much, James. And um, so a few, few minutes for questions. So, so uh, as you all know, we've got a hog roast, which has just arrived at the back, and we probably smell it. So um, we need to start speeding up, I guess. Uh, you're getting anxious, but uh, we've got James Mill uh, shortly, and then I'm going to say a f 10 minutes at the end on bits and pieces. So, any questions? So, hedge fund managers rule the market? Uh, they, they don't. They, they, I, we always say they amplify the impacts of the fundamentals. Amplify so, the impact, yeah, not they, rule the market. They, they only, yeah, Chicago at the moment, they hold 20% of all the open interest. Um, uh, and so, yeah, they're a big player, but it's not, it's not the only factor which needs to be watched. Okay. Any, any questions or comments from floor or shall we move on okay so James has, has got a, um, a stand at the back so bits and pieces I, I get your email quarter past five every day I think do I yeah, I think, around, yeah. yeah around quarter past five every day I get a CRM email about so with all the all the data and everything but I, I don't sell grain of course but yeah. I still get it okay thanks James um, so can we thank James please <laughs>